Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're looking at uh, why Ukraine's uh, conflict uh, has now flared up in uh, the last uh, two weeks. We're doing so in the company of uh, Alex uh, Ryabchin, member of the Ukrainian parliament from Yulia Timoshenko's Fatherland Party. Thanks for being with us from Kiev. Uh, Anna Garmash of the advocacy group Ukraine Action. Uh, journalist Dmitry Dukochko and from Washington, Hannah Thoburn, research fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, Ukraine on the agenda this Monday at a meeting of EU foreign ministers, where even though the UK has one foot out of Europe, well, it's singing from the same hymn sheet as the others. Talking uh, about the recent upsurge in violence, everybody's very concerned about that. So the causes, as you know, aren't quite clear. There's a bit of murkiness about who initiated that. But uh, we will be, the UK will be insisting that there is no case for relaxation of the sanctions, uh, every case for keeping up the, the pressure on, on Russia. All right, every case for keeping up the pressure on Russia, and he seemed to be addressing his remarks as much to Washington as Moscow. Donald Trump spoke to Petro Poroshenko over the weekend. The White House statement quoted Mr. Trump as saying he would work with Ukraine, Russia, quote, and all other parties involved to help them restore peace along the border. Along the border, does that mean the internationally recognized border between Ukraine and Russia? Or does that mean the uh, current front line of the fighting? The remarks uh, sowing a bit of confusion. And it followed an interview where Fox News asked the new U.S. president about his relations with Vladimir Putin. Do you respect Putin? I do respect him. Do you? But Why? Well, I respect a lot of people, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get along with him. He's a leader of his country. Uh, I say it's better to get along with Russia than not. And if Russia helps us in the fight against ISIS, which is a major fight, and Islamic terrorism all over the world, right. major fight, that's a good thing. Will I get along with him? I have no idea. It's He's very a possible killer, I though. Won't. Putin's a killer. A lot of killers. We got a lot of killers. Why, well, you think our country's so innocent? You think our country's so innocent? Hannah Thober, what was your reaction to that? Yeah, you know, this has been a, a remark that's gotten a lot of attention here in Washington, uh, this kind of idea that uh, the president of the, United, of the United States is drawing essentially a moral, moral equivalence between uh, Russia and the United States. And I think you're seeing people on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, come out and, and condemn this statement. I mean, I, I think it's extremely worrying, particularly at a time when uh, opposition leaders like my friend Vladimir Karamorza are sitting in, in hospital beds, potentially and most likely poisoned uh, by, by people who don't want him to continue his work uh, promoting free societies and civil societies in Russia. So it, it's certainly you know, extremely disappointing for the U.S. president to have said that. It's extremely disappointing for the U.S. president to have said that at a time when, when the fighting coming from the, the eastern part of Ukraine, backed by uh, the Kremlin is, is ramping up and it's continuing to kill uh, Ukrainian civilians and soldiers. Dmitry Dikochko, does this... Um... I think a killer is a killer. And it's, a tr it's true that Americans have also many killers, if you admit that there are killers everywhere. Yes, there are. And among the, the chief of states, and happily, yes, there are. But I think that the war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, etc., etc., have killed right, a lot the question of I was people. Gonna ask a lot you... of people. So I think Trump is right, in fact. Uh, and moral, how can you make a distinction between killer, American and Russian? I don't, I don't understand. So which way, do you, you kill Donald, people which anyway. way do you think Donald Trump is but, going when it comes to, to sanctions on Russia? I, you know, I don't think that, I don't know why, I, I don't think that these sanctions have any efficiency uh, about right, the but I'm war, asking you which way do you war think he's going? Ukraine. Which way do you think Trump is going? I don't know. I'm, I don't know what Trump right. will do. Nobody knows, in fact. What I would like to know, and that I think this is Mr. MP from, this, from the party of uh, Yulia Tymoshenko could answer us, what is exactly the rule of Yulia Tymoshenko and what are her contacts with Trump? And I think that Mr. Poroshenko is quite, uh, well, uh, uneasy with that. Alex so Re I know that there were contacts. Even Yulia Tymoshenko has said that she would meet 
uh, Mr. Trump and not Poroshenko. Uh, what does that mean? Alex Ryabchin? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I would say that definitely uh, President Trump met with the leader of my political faction, Yulia Tymoshenko, during the national prayer uh, breakfast, and they had a private conversation. Uh, and the only thing we could tell that uh, Trump words that uh, don't worry, Ukraine won't be forgotten. So he knows about the situation. He uh, he was briefed by Yulia Tymoshenko about the international situation within Ukraine and about which she spoke about the sanctions should not be lifted because sanctions is a very effective way to stop Russia. And this is why Putin trying to intensificate, you know, the the uh, to, to raise the the, the stakes. She, he's, she tried to attack Avdivka because definitely it's a very crucial point for the separatists, for example, to establish control over the uh, key, uh, uh, key travel road, key, uh, in, in, in key industrial enterprises also there. And he's testing not only, uh, not only Trump's ability, but also European integrity. And it's definitely when we met with Boris Johnson, and I'm the head of the UK Ukraine friendship group, we met with him. He also know about the situation, and he called this a war. European leaders, also France leaders, Germany leaders, call this a war. And only you know several people who is influenced by the Russian propaganda call it a civil war. It's not a civil war. We are fine. With, we are as Ukrainian people who are living in Donetsk, in Luhansk, in Crimea. We are fine with the so Ukrainians. So you, you don't think that Trump's re remarks mean that he's wavering in any way? Uh, I would say definitely nobody knows what Trump will do, but I think that while he will become much more efficient in international policy, while he will receive more brief, while he will stand understanding and receive a, a, a very important situation in Ukraine as a key country to the security of the not only uh, not only Europe but the whole European and Eurasian region, he will definitely not stop backup in uh, Ukraine. Uh, Anna Garmesh, your thoughts on and you know and you know I go ahead, uh, uh, Anna Thorburn. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, from from the D.C. perspective, we we still here in Washington are not uh, very clear on the direction that President Trump's policy towards both Russia and Ukraine will take. We're still waiting for key officials to be appointed to the most important positions in the National Security Council, the Defense Department, the State Department. So a lot of us are sitting here sort of reading tea leaves and, and really waiting to see what's going to happen. And I think these are interesting first signs but we can't draw too much of a conclusion just yet. Uh, Anna Garmisch, Dmitry Dikochko mentioning uh, the, the divisions in Kiev, you know, in, between politicians, uh, Yulia Tymoshenko versus P President Poroshenko. Uh, are, are there differences that are perhaps undermining Kiev's position? I wouldn't say they're uh, sorry, really Trump, undermining the Kiev's position. Well, I'm, again, I'm, I can only talk as an observer from the outside, uh, not being in any way in, involved in the government. However, it seems like um, Yulia Tymoshenko's position and Petro Poroshenko's position are actually pretty much the same, because both of them want to stop this war and both of them want to stop this fighting. Just to get back to actually to a previous point that was mentioned in the first part, part of the debate was as to um, the motivations of both sides. Clearly, Avdiivka is a town that has been under Ukrainian control for quite a while now, I think. Since two, 2014. Exactly. Um, and the, the Ukrainian side is, has basically no reason to retake a town that's already, you know, is already under, under Ukrainian control. And shelling civilians or shelling anybody there is, there is no point. So testing anybody is, can, could possibly, could, I cannot imagine how this can be a motivation for Petro, Petro Poroshenko. All right, Ukraine has other problems. Uh, it's teetering on the bank of, uh, brink of bankruptcy. Uh, this winter's low temperatures mean the state has had to turn the heat on earlier than planned. Uh, in a report where he went to Dnipro, uh, Leonid Ragozin wrote, Ukraine is the world's third most likely country to default on foreign debt and remains dependent on the IMF's four-year, $17.5 billion bailout plan, which requires energy sector reform and the removal of utility subsidies. Uh, Dmitry Dikochko, I heard you hint that perhaps uh, this is a way to uh, get off the hook of paying back their debts and reforming? Is that what you were suggesting earlier? Um, no, poor Ukrainian people, in fact, because they have suffered that, of course. Uh, well, I think uh, one of the big risks is that uh, because of this economic situation and because the uh, 
the absence of perspective of any any perspective yes for the ukrainian policy which is now uh, which is led now uh, it it is possible that ukraine can be used to 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 to, to lead an aggressive policy against russia by some forces in the United States. I don't know what Trump will do with that. Um, All right, but that that's I your think suggestion. it would have been uh, Alex reaction, it would the, have been used. The piece in, in Bloomberg mentioned how there's been this all-out war on, on breaking the oligarchs in Ukraine, and the fear is that with what's going on now, uh, they may get, well, a, a sort of stay of execution, since right now, if you really want to go full throttle on liberalizing the energy sector and the such, uh, there just there just isn't the, the the backbone right now. People would be all left without uh, any heat on. Um, you know, first uh, with the president, we are united on international. So now we could, like, I'm from opposition party led by opposition leader, and we could argue a lot in within the country. You know, about corruption, about the course of the country. But internationally, we are united completely. We know we are fighting for the same values for the international support. I'm working in the Energy Committee, and I'm consider myself as one of the most green MPs. So we do a lot to do my, our country more, like to, to to provide more renewables, to do much more energy efficiency, because we are one of the most energy inefficient nations. So we did a lot of, you know, Euro integration law to change our legislation to be much more energy efficient. Also, we're trying, to, we have a lot of our own uh, capacity and deposit of gas, and we're trying to extract the gas, not to be de dependent on Russia. But what about, uh, Alex, what about in the short term? At this point in time, can Ukraine pay back its debts? And is the IMF asking too much of you? Uh, uh, yeah, we have problem with the IMF, of course. We, we are not able to survive without the IMF yet. That's why I would like to, to change the course of the country. And we, our team is much, no, is much more professional than the current government. But this is not the reality that we are speaking. But definitely, we are not going into the right direction. But we need to, to have our contacts with the IMF. We need to liberalize our economy. We need to have the foreign investor. And that's the course that we in country have the consensus from the opposition and the, from the coalition. We need to have more investment. We have to have much more of our own extraction of the gas, and we have to have much more energy security from Russia. And this is when the country is moving. Gradually, not so radical. We are not leapfrogging. We are not leapfrogging in a sustainable development. We are not leapfrogging in promoting renewables. But we are doing this gradually, step by step. Of course, we have problems with oligarch, but we the oligarch is our economy uh, considerably. Yes, we still got some of them. We still got problems with the anti corruption institution, but you are not able to uh, do this in a country that's in war in, you know, in two or three years. Romania, it took 10 years for Romania with being within the country in the European Union to successfully fight with the corruption. And we see how the civil society in Romania and Bucharest is now, now developing. Ukraine is different from Russia, from Belarus, that we have such the same civil society, really great civil society that, that drives us as and, a politician. And it, just in the short term, Alex Ryabshin, will Ukraine meet its commitments? Uh, uh, sorry? In the short term, will Ukraine meet its commitments to uh, uh, its donors oh, and to they, its uh, loans, uh, people who've, who've given any them loans? Problem with this, any problem with this we don't have, and I think that today the government said that they finalized the next tranche with the IMF. So if the IMF trusts us, that the investors would also trust us, they will back up us uh, for the, and I hope that you know, the new administration in the U.S. Uh, with a big, you know, experience in business will forge the economic ties between our two nations. That's, that's what we need. Hannah Thoburn, uh, the resurgence in fighting, how is it going to impact uh, Ukraine's commitments to reform? Yeah, so I want to, if I could, go back just to this question on energy for just a second, because I think it is important to note that Ukraine ended up in the terrible financial position it's in, in large part because the former uh, president, Viktor Yanukovych, basically robbed the country blind. He took massive amounts of money with him when he fled, and Ukraine had found itself in the position that it's been in since 2014. It has actually come a long way. Foreign currency reserves are starting to grow again. A lot of those uh, energy reforms have started to be made, and these are reforms that the IMF uh, said were necessary in order to, to get uh, these new tranches uh, of money 
So you're seeing reforms being made, those um, subsidies for energy that have made the country very energy inefficient have now been largely removed, though there's, net, there's assistance for people who are too poor to, to be able to pay. So I do think Ukraine's moving in a positive direction when it comes to reform, particularly in the energy sector. But every time there's a flare up in the fighting, every time Ukraine has to put more and more resources towards uh, fighting a war that they don't want in, in their east, a war that's really been imposed upon them from the outside, they have to make tough financial decisions. And that does, to a certain extent, hold them back from making the reforms that they need in the country. My concern, however, is that sometimes the Ukrainian government uses the war really as an excuse. They'll say, well, we can't do this reform because of the war. Uh, they'll, they'll hold back on doing reforms that they really could do, but perhaps they just don't want to do because it's politically difficult or they have personal interests, they have business interests. And so you do see the war being used in, as an excuse to not make reforms. And that's what I think disturbs me and, and concerns me more than anything else. Anna Garmesh, you agree? Actually, yes, I do, because um, one must say that some reforms have been made and um, one could really not say that nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing has moved since, uh, since you know, the end of Euromaidan or since the beginning of the war. Things have moved into the positive direction. However, yes, um, the civil society, the population has expected it to move faster and would like it to move faster. And I also have a feeling that sometimes that you do use the word just as an excuse. Um, what has proven very efficient, however, to um, foster those reforms is pretty much combined pressure from the Ukrainian civil society as well as international pressure. So in the end, mm -hmm. as if those two factors uh, have enough, well, sort of push in the Ukrainian government enough, reforms happen. But how much of a toll is it taking on public opinion? Because the reports I'm reading, people uh, who uh, in their homes are cold all the time. They have to bring like, electric heaters into the bathroom uh, mm. before they can take a bath because it's so cold in there. It's just uh, conditions where people in a lot of places just don't have the money to, to, to pay for a big uh, electric bill or, or a big heating bill, excuse me. And uh, it's, it's got to take a toll after a while in politics. Uh, it does, actually. But the thing is, um, we also know that uh, given the situation with the war and with the Russian aggression, um, people do feel united against the common enemy anyway. And so, and also, um, they have al already an experience with, you know, pressuring the government, trying to make something work. Um, since 2004, the Orange Revolution, or now the Maidan, they have just realized that pretty much whoever is in power, the only way reform is going to happen is by pressure from the civil society. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen. If you just um, elect somebody who make ni makes nice promises and tries to um, make you sort of woo you into um, supporting him or her, uh, in the end, unless the civil society does something, nothing is going to happen. So. If let's imagine we replace uh, Mr. Poroshenko with somebody else, the same situation is going to be in place. Mm. The civil society will have to push for more reform. All right, just a final point, which is the, the uh, right now there is this protocol, which is the Minsk agreement, right? You have Ukraine, Russia, Germany and France acting as brokers. And Donetsk and Lugansk. And, and, and the question is, is this the best format at this particular point in time? There are no others now, <laughs> so this one exists. And why doesn't, if, if the Kiev government doesn't want war, as you wanted to say from the United States, uh, why don't they uh, make the reform and why don't they apply the Minsk, uh, the Minsk agreement on the change in the constitution? All right, Alex, reaction, the, you agree that the, uh, the Minsk, of Ukraine. The, the Minsk protocol do is the best one on, on offer right now? Uh, as I said, Minsk protocol is, a, is like riding a dead horse, but this is the only thing that we have. We will not do anything changes on our constitution or political until we will receive security, security first, first then they come political decision. This is how the Minsk protocol logic was written. So Ukraine need only three things from, from West, time, 
trust and backup. Everything will be okay with our country and Russia will be get lost from, from our country. Can I just react to that, maybe? Um, the Minsk Agreement, um, well, we only have that, that's for sure. However, the Minsk Agreement has a certain number of points that need to be uh, respected. Um, one of them being in ele- being holding elections in those areas, another one being closing the border and stopping the supply of arms and men into, into, those, re- into the, those two regions. In the end, how can you truly hold elections if you do not, your law basically doesn't apply in those regions? How can you call, hold elections in, if basically the people who are in power there are warlords suppl- with um, arms and men supplied by Russia? If you truly want to but, have a reconciliation, but you have, have reform. You have to make the reform before holding the elections. That is if the point. You, if, you, if you want to hold elections or make any sort of reform, you have to indeed have security and secure the border to not yeah. have anything pouring in. All right, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank Anna Garmesh. I want to thank uh, Alex Ryabchin in Kiev, Hannah Thoburn in Washington, Dmitry Dikochko. Stay with us, though. It's time for Media Watch. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Hi there. We've been reading the tea leaves, as Hannah Thoburn said, about uh, <laughs> when Washington's stance with this new administration when it comes to Moscow. Can the same be said about France ahead of the presidential election? Well, there's an awful lot of speculation about just how Russia-friendly both the conservative candidate François Fillon and the far-right candidate Marine Le Pen really are. Um, and it is something that, that is getting quite a lot of people talking. Um, François Fillon, of course, is currently clinging with bloodied fingertips to his presidential uh, hopes. He gave a press conference this afternoon, which many people expected him uh, in, that, in the course of that to actually announce that he was pulling out. He didn't. One of the issues that he did address was this uh, claim in uh, Le Canon Enchaîné, uh, among many others, that his consulting business um, had been paid huge amounts of money by Russian clients. He said his, he, his business had never had ties to Russia. He, as uh, Sputnik, a Russian news uh, website, points out, um, he claimed that no Russian companies or people are among his clients. They said it unprompted, if I recall correctly. Yes, absolutely. He wasn't asked a question about Russia. You might have thought that he'd have tried to sweep it under the carpet, but no, he, he put it out mm. there in the initial sort of speech part of his uh, address to the press. Um, But it is, of course, just one of the controversies that is haunting him right now. Um, The largest, of course, being Penelope Gate, uh, the claim that he had given almost a million euros of public money to family members for jobs that simply didn't exist. That is the allegation. Um, Le Figaro has this on its on the front page of its website right now. Le Figaro, of course, uh, right-leaning in its uh, political uh, stance. Uh, Nothing will change my mind. I am the candidate for the presidential election. Uh, he's currently meeting uh, with other party members now, trying to really re unite everyone. Um, Some people on social media seem to have been won over. Perhaps they were already convinced beforehand. Who knows? Um, This person saying that uh, he supports Francois Fillon. It is a storm in a glass of water. I don't know if that's the French equivalent of a storm in a teacup. Yes, it is. Okay, jolly good. Mm. Um, uh, This Twitter user, too, saying that uh, he is now the most transparent presidential candidate. That's one way to put it. Um, And that he reconfirms his total support for him. Lots of other people feel very differently, though. Uh, This person highlighting the fact that he said no one has the right to judge the work of a parliamentary assistant, but she says everyone has the right to know where public money is going. Uh, Other people commenting at this one, obviously rather a humorous look at it. Uh, The quote was, uh, I am honest, and you've got his political rivals there, Francois Hollande, Nicolas Sarkozy, and Manuel Valls, all photographed having a good chuckle. This Twitter user, though, paraphrasing him uh, on the fact that he said, just because my wife said she didn't work for me doesn't mean she didn't work for me. And this is at the real heart of Penelope Gate, Mm. because, of course, last week we learned that she had said in 2007 that she had never worked for her husband. But Le Canard and Chenet have published uh, allegations that she had already worked for him for years by that point, pocketing hundreds of thousands of euros. Absolutely. So... It is really at the heart of whether or not this is true. Um, Now, the person who carried out the interview in 2007 is Kim Wilshire. Uh, She's written in The Guardian about her unwitting role in this whole scandal. Um, And she she talks about the context of that quote, because a lot of people say it's been taken out of context, Francois Fillon among them. Um, But here she talks about the fact that, that it was said 
in, amidst the rest of the conversation, it all made sense and it hasn't been taken out of context. And she has even tweeted this directly to Francois Fillon in response to his remarks today, uh, saying, no, Monsieur Fillon, um, the remarks, uh, the, the the Envoy Special, which was the programme that aired this interview, did not take those remarks out of context. So she's directly addressing him, saying that at best he's wrong, uh, at worst he is lying. All right, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank you and um, Emma James. Of course, this is what they call a story that has legs on it. So we'll be <laughs> following more on it. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.